Good evening, I'm Paul Sharrett, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to London and the much-anticipated gun debate. The topic is, of course, one of the most important and controversial issues of our time on both sides of the Atlantic and perhaps around the world. Our two debaters, both ardent and outspoken advocates of their particular views, our moderator, Paul Davers, is a well-known television personality and presenter in the UK. Well, it promises to be quite an evening. A little later on, we'll tell you how you'll have a chance to use your computer to interact with the debate and help to determine who wins. From time to time, we'll be checking in to remind you of the voting process and give you the all-important password. Remember, voting does not commence until after the debate. However, at this moment, it's time to take you to the historic library of King's College London, where it's my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator, Mr. Paul Lavers. Thank you and welcome. What you are about to witness can truly be described as remarkable. We have two of the most outspoken individuals in the world representing widely divergent viewpoints on the subject of gun control. Each is a knowledgeable and formidable defender of their position, and both have come well prepared for this debate. So that we might stick to our chosen subject and a rather strict television schedule, we will be employing a set of guidelines for the debate. Before we go into the rules of the debate, let's meet each of our debaters. First, ladies and gentlemen, a woman who has been at the forefront of the discussion regarding international gun control. She is a proponent of limiting the proliferation of small arms around the world and the director of IANSA, which is the International Action Network on Small Arms. It's my privilege to introduce to you Ms. Rebecca Peters. And now, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most active and outspoken supporters of gun rights in the US and defender of the Second Amendment, the Executive Vice President of the National Rifle Association. For over 12 years now, it's an honor to present Mr. Wayne Lapierre. Welcome to both of you. As I mentioned, we are bound to a stringent set of rules that spells out the procedures for this debate. Firstly, each debater will set the ball rolling with an opening statement which will last for no more than 12 minutes. At the 11 minute mark, a bell will ring, giving whoever is speaking a one minute warning, signifying that it's time to wrap up their statement. At that point, the representative of the opposing viewpoint will have 12 minutes for their opening statement. After both sides have presented their case, I will ask a question to one debater at a time, alternating backwards and forwards. After a debater has had a chance to answer the question, the opposer will get the chance to rebut, and I will allow a final comment from the person who was originally asked the question. And we're going to give, of course, members of the audience here the opportunity to ask several questions. Now, the debate will conclude with each side making a closing statement. But first of all, let's hear the motion. The motion for tonight. Should the United States Senate support the proposed United Nations Treaty that bans private ownership of guns? That's the motion for tonight. And now, let's give the floor to Rebecca Peters, who will begin with her opening argument. Ms. Peters, you have 12 minutes. Thank you, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, I represent IANSA, the International Action Network on Small Arms. 
It's the global movement against gun violence, a network of some 600 organizations working against the proliferation and misuse of guns around the world. Our network consists of women's groups, churches, public health agencies, academics, human rights campaigners, humanitarian workers, victim support groups, lawyers, people who would prefer not to spend their time thinking about guns, but whose work and lives are so badly affected by the proliferation of these weapons that they have taken on this cause in addition to their other commitments. The involvement of people from so many different sectors means that IANSA's thinking and action are grounded not only in research and information, but also in the direct experience of our members on the front line. Whether they're in the slums of Manila, the marketplaces of Kenya or Uganda, or the battlefields of the Democratic Republic of Congo, that is where the destructive reality of gun proliferation can be seen. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul has said this is a controversial topic that we're debating tonight. Why is it controversial? Because it's literally a question of life or death. Hundreds of thousands of lives are lost prematurely each year, ended by gunshots from people who are angry, vengeful, jealous, drunk, or careless, or corrupt, or simply abusive. Most of these deaths occur in the developing world. For example, 36,000 people die from gunshot wounds each year in Brazil. But the developed world is not immune, and especially not the USA, which has 28,000 gun deaths each year, including 11,500 gun homicides. Unfortunately, many members of IANSA have personally experienced the pain and loss caused by gun violence and some of them are here tonight. Apart from deaths, millions more lives are devastated by injuries and grief caused by gun violence. For every person killed by small arms, three more are seriously wounded. Those injuries are especially disabling in the developing world. One of our members who works in the rehabilitation of gunshot victims in Guatemala has pointed out that poor families there can never afford to buy a wheelchair. So a young person paralyzed from a gunshot wound is doomed to spend all of their time at home, except for the odd occasion when a strong uncle or cousin is available to carry them outside. Gun violence is expensive. Some countries in Latin America are now spending up to 5% of their gross domestic product on the consequences of violence. And gun violence is the most expensive gun violence there is. One of our members, a surgeon from Uganda, sees firsthand the impact of gun violence. She talks about the frustration of trying to save the lives of gunshot victims in rudimentary hospitals and being faced with the dilemma of diverting medical attention and resources, and possibly the blood supply, from a sick child to a person wounded by guns. Most gun victims are civilians, especially young men, who should be in the most productive phase of their lives. But women and children are affected in particular ways as well. In conflict and post-conflict zones, from Sudan to Afghanistan to the former Yugoslavia, sexual violence has become a weapon of war. In non-conflict zones, Women are always at risk of domestic violence, but a gun in the house makes it much more likely that a woman will die. The widespread availability of guns has given rise to the phenomenon of child soldiers and child drug traffickers, because from Sierra Leone to Brazil to Colombia and Sri Lanka, because guns are now so cheap and light and easily available, an eight-year-old can be trained to use them in battle. Guns are involved in human rights abuses in Liberia, in Nepal, in Iraq, and El Salvador. Guns obstruct peacekeeping activities. Just this year in June, we saw Médecins Sans Frontières pull out of Afghanistan because five of its humanitarian aid workers had been shot dead there. Guns hinder development, investment, and tourism. 
Countries that depend on tourism can see their economies crippled by incidents of armed violence. And aid projects have been frozen or canceled in many countries because of insecurity. That's why the aid that was promised to rebuild Afghanistan has been so slow in coming, because of insecurity there due to the proliferation of guns. So what is this global proliferation of guns? There are about 640 million guns in the world. That's one for every 10 people on Earth. Two thirds of those guns are owned by private citizens. 640 million, that's more guns than cars, for example, on Earth. The large number of guns points to the other reason why tonight's topic is controversial, because it's a question of money. The manufacture and sale of guns and ammunition is an industry worth seven and a half billion dollars. About half the countries in the world produce guns, and every country in the world buys them. The biggest exporter of guns is the USA, but Europe, both Western and Eastern, make a huge contribution to the problem. Add to this the millions of guns released onto the private market, thanks to the ending of the Cold War and the dismantling of those huge armies there, and you can see why the problem has become so immense. Guns don't respect borders. In East Africa, in the Balkans, in Central America, one country's gun laws can be undermined by the next country. For example, we see this actually in the, U in the USA. Both Mexico and Canada report that the majority of guns used in crime near across the border have come from the USA. Guns move not only between countries, but also between conflicts. Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, two members of ours, have revealed that guns used in the Liberian conflict under Charles Taylor were then supplied to the revolutionary United Front of Sierra Leone. Guns are remarkably durable. They outlive the relationship between the original buyer and seller. They retain their value because they keep on killing. How is all this regulated? We have a patchwork of laws in different countries, some countries with almost no laws and no international regulation. In the past few years, the global community has begun to recognize the dimensions of this problem, the disproportionate damage that results from the proliferation of these weapons. Short-term profits have begun to look less important compared with regional instability, humanitarian crises, and terrorism. Governments, international organizations, and a growing movement of civil society organizations are saying, stop, put the brakes on. The arms trade is out of control. So around the world, countries are tightening their gun laws, internally on the manufacture and sale and possession of guns, and also reviewing their international policies on exports and brokering of guns. In the past 10 years, the gun laws have been reformed in a number of countries, including Australia, Canada, Germany, the UK, in Lebanon, in Turkey, in South Africa, in Guatemala and Brazil, just to name a few. There's a constant battle for gun control going on in the US, of course, where the gun laws are different in all 50 states. But in general, the movement is toward tighter regulation of guns. And we're seeing results. It takes time for the effect of gun law reforms to become visible, but there are many factors influencing violence in different countries, but we can see the results now. In my own country, Australia, for example, we overhauled the gun laws in 1996 after we had the world's worst shooting massacre there. We hold a record in Australia that no one would wish to break, 35 people killed in the course of one massacre. For many years, it had been obvious that the gun laws needed reform. And after that tragedy, we got it, including national uniform gun laws, a ban on semi-automatic rifles and shotguns, and a buyback of 640,000 of those guns. We saw gun homicides drop sharply after the new laws came in. And by 2002, the gun homicide rate was at its lowest since 1950. Since 1996, there's been more than a 40% reduction in all forms of gun death. Nowadays, Americans are 16 times more likely to be killed with a gun than Australians. In 2002, Australia had 50 gun murders, compared with 11,500 in the US. Canada also tightened its gun laws in the mid-90s, 
and also saw the gun homicide rate drop steadily. It was 20% lower in 2002 than in 1995. Nowadays, Americans are eight times more likely to be killed with a gun than Canadians are. In 2002, Canada had 150 gun murders compared with 11,500 in the US. Here in the UK, the reforms to the gun laws have revealed something about criminals' taste in guns. The UK banned handguns in 1997, except for some handguns that were deemed to be air guns or replicas. Lo and behold, we now find that those guns make up the largest category of guns used in crime in Britain. In other words, criminals are taking advantage of a loophole using the guns that were poorly controlled by the law. By the way, Americans are 40 times more likely to be killed by guns than Britons. In 2003, Britain had 68 gun murders compared with 11,500 in the USA. The UN Secretary General Kofi Annan has said, even in societies not beset by civil war, the easy availability of small arms has contributed to violence and political instability and damaged development prospects and imperiled human security in every way. The member states of the United Nations have agreed on a program of action to reduce small arms. It has some very, very moderate measures. Countries agree that the, there will be an offense of criminal possession of guns, for example. The, the, the discussion over international regulation of guns is extremely robust, and the gun lobby is part of that. I've seen at the UN conferences on small arms the gun lobby at work, and I have to say that in my observation, the US, the US National Rifle Association wields a very high level of influence with the US government. And this may, may be one reason why the US has taken a different position from nearly all other governments in the UN small arms process. The program of action, yeah, finish off. I'll finish off. For example, the US has refused to allow a provision that would prevent governments from supplying guns to insurgent groups and other non-state actors. That meeting was held two months before September 11, 2001, when the Taliban, a group of non-state actors which had been armed by the US government for years, yes, launched its campaign that provoked the present war on terror. I wonder whether the US would have taken the same position in support of arming non-state actors if the program of action had been drawn up a few months later than September 11, 2001. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Peters. Thank you very much, Ms. Peters. And now we give the floor to Wayne Lapierre, who will give his opening statement. Mr. Lapierre. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. At the outset, let's be clear that neither Ms. Peters nor the United Nations has a monopoly on genuine compassion for the injustice that exists in our world. All of us would wish to end tyranny and atrocity, poverty and disease. For decades, the people of the United States have provided not lip service, but unrivaled levels of aid and assistance to those in need across this planet. Yet, you just heard Ms. Peters, in essence, claim that some of our freedoms cause some of the world's problems. You've heard Ms. Peters call me to take responsibility for, and even offer solutions for many of the world's most ancient and complex challenges. Central to her mission is a new gargantuan global bureaucracy endowed with sweeping controls that Ms. Peters, through the United Nations, intends to impose upon the world, on every one, on every gun, without exception. I'm here to oppose this baseless initiative on behalf of the freest people in the history of mankind, the people of the United States. Of its 90 million law-abiding gun owners and the millions of members of the National Rifle Association, I'm here to say I believe in arming the good guys and in disarming the bad guys. And I'm here to rise in opposition to this new face of global socialism that history has exposed 
time and time again as a colossal failure. I'm not here to impose upon any nation the freedoms we enjoy in the United States, though I wish I could. Unlike Ms. Peters, who seeks to impose her failures upon all peoples of all the world, her social experiments in gun registration and confiscation have been monumental failures. Trusting in her flawed logic, good people gave up their guns, only to watch it backfire in record-setting criminal brutality visited upon the formerly free people of Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom here, and other countries. That is a simple, sad fact. And that's why this issue must be approached on a less emotional and with much more common sense basis. Whether it's billed as gun control or arms rights or illicit weapons, it's a debate as ancient as mankind and as fresh as today's newspaper because it's a topic that strikes deep in our hearts. Then that belief is tortured by statistics twisted for each new debate. Today, instead, trust your instincts to lead you to the truth. Listen with an open mind. Sidestep the dogma of the day. Let what you hear be balanced by your rational mind and compassionate heart, and the truth will find you. Trust your soul more than any statistics, because 25 years in this arena have taught me, stripped bare of cheap drama and emotional manipulation, the right to bear arms in defense of self, family, and country is ultimately self-evident. Reduced to its core, it's about human freedom, human worth, and self-destiny. I realize that Ms. Peters and her powerful groups at the United Nations have a different point of view. What I don't understand is by what authority do they impose their views on the citizens of the United States? What arrogance leads them to think they have a better idea than our Bill of Rights? Two centuries ago, our founding fathers rejected such foreign intervention, and so do I. Because in its extreme and final form, those who barter away their freedom gain not security, but surrender and ultimately slavery. That's why I reject the self-appointed jurisdictions of the United Nations, led by Ms. Peters, over the freedoms guaranteed by the Bill of Rights and the Constitution of the United States. As an organization, the NRA is vastly outnumbered and outfunded by Ms. Peters and the UN. The NRA exists on $35 checks from individual middle-class Americans who for their dues get a magazine and a margin of hope that their collective voice will ultimately preserve their freedoms. But IANSA is not a small project struggling in the shadows of a shoestring. Ms. Peter's group is a global collection of 500 member organizations from 100 different nations, fueled by funding from a maze of countries grants, foundations, and big benefactors. Their stated goal is to endow themselves with a global control of all firearms, long guns, handguns, civilian or military, legal or illegal, everywhere for everyone, be it between countries or cousins. So we are at a crossroads. If our freedom weren't so precious, and if the threat weren't so clear and present, I wouldn't be here in these hallowed halls pleading with everyone within the sound of my voice that our planet is not growing more free but less free with every sun that sets. Because more and more supposedly free peoples are submitting to the empty promises of Ms. Peters and her United Nations. Ms. Peters, we are at an historic collision course here between what you want for the world and what the world wants. So forgive me for asking, if you can't bring yourself to respect the Bill of Rights, at least keep your hands off it. The Bill of Rights is why America is the freest nation in history. That's why I side with the visionaries who founded our nation in the belief that law-abiding people have a right to keep and bear arms. So I say it loud and clear and without apology, I'm all about arming the good guys and disarming the bad guys. It has been the mission of the NRA to extend the right to carry to all lawful Americans. 
If this phrase is new to you, right to carry means if you're a law-abiding citizen and you take a training course, pass a test, and pay a fee, you have the right to carry a concealed firearm. Places that reject the right to carry and ban guns became cesspools of violent crime. Places like Boston, New York City, Washington, D.C. And now, London, where good people cower behind locks. Well, you're now in London six times more likely to be mugged than in New York City because bad guys are armed while good guys are disarmed, and the bad guys know it. On my watch, since 1987, millions of Americans in 37 states, that's two-thirds of the United States, have been licensed to carry a concealed firearm. And crime has dropped in every single one of those states. We intend to fight until that is the law of the land. Because if you're a lawful citizen licensed to carry a concealed firearm, I have nothing to fear from you, absolutely nothing. In fact, I want you riding my subway and living next door. Because if a threat happens on a subway car or stalks our neighborhood, I want you there to offer defense, not Miss Peters, who would put all criminals on notice that everyone's defenseless. The deterrent effect of the right to carry is powerful and proven in the United States. A small percentage of Americans choose the right to carry, but the bad guys don't know who's armed and who's not. And when the predators can't tell the lions from the sheep, the whole flock is a lot safer. That's why, by every measure, right to carry is a success. Without exception, right to carry has produced lower rates of violent crime and made our neighborhoods and communities safer. That's why I'm a passionate advocate of arming good people. With equal passion, I advocate disarming bad people and putting them away. The only way to protect society from predators is to remove predators from society. We're doing that in the United States, NRA leading the way. Violent crime rates are the lowest in 25 years. But in obedience to Ms. Peter's philosophy, Australia, England, and Canada did the opposite. They banned guns, and they got the opposite effect. Much higher rates of crime because predators rule the day and terrorize the night. No citizens group on Earth has invested even a fraction of the manpower, resources the National Rifle Association has to find, arrest, prosecute, and imprison bad guys with guns. The problem wasn't that we didn't have enough gun laws on the books. The problem was enforcing the laws we had. So we pioneered mandatory sentences that mean what they say. We pioneered three strikes and you're out, prison building, and your third federal firearm offense means life in prison. We pioneered Project Exile that exposed the Clinton administration's failure to prosecute felons in possession of guns. Felons were getting off, people got killed, and crime got worse. While Ms. Peters was busy leading the so-called Million Mom March to ban guns and blame the NRA, we turned Project Exile into a national movement. It's stunningly simple and effective. If you're a convicted felon and you're caught with a gun, whether you're robbing a bank or if you simply have a gun on you and have drugs on you, or if you're just walking your dog and you're a convicted felon and you're in possession of a firearm, that's it. You're going to prison for a minimum of five years. No plea bargain, no parole, no probation, period and violent crime was slashed in half almost overnight. So I appear here in defense of our nation, our sovereignty, and our freedoms. Good people have the right to keep and bear arms, and bad people must be disarmed and put in prison. And neither Ms. Peters nor the United Nation nor any other foreign influence may claim jurisdiction to meddle with the freedoms guaranteed by our Bill of Rights, endowed by our Creator, and due to all humankind. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the opening statements from both protagonists. Both very interesting and raising a number of issues that I know have made me think of a few questions, and I'm sure that you'll probably be the same. We'll be coming back in a couple of minutes to ask those questions. Thank you. In a moment, our moderator, Paul Davis, will begin asking our debaters a series of questions. Also, as we mentioned earlier, the debate you're watching is not just for those fortunate enough to be sitting ringside. You at home also have an opportunity to make your voices heard. We invite you to access our website, where at the end of the programme you'll be able to answer questions yourself and cast your vote on how well each side argued their case. I'll be back soon to tell you how to get onto our website to give you the secret password you need to vote and how to participate in this controversial event. Right now, though, let's get back to the debate in the library of King's College. Once again, our moderator, Paul Labors. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard Ms. Peters and Mr. Lapierre's opening statements. We've been painted a clear picture of the opposing viewpoints. Now we begin our question and answer portion of the debate. Some people would call it the debate itself. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to ask questions of each of the debater one at a time, alternating backwards and forwards. After the question has been answered, the opposer will get their chance to rebut then I will allow a final comment from the person who originally was asked the question. We begin with Ms. Peters. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to call you Rebecca now, sure. and I'm going to call Thank Wayne, you. just so that we know where we are. Rebecca, do you believe that US citizens should be forced to obey a United Nations gun ban treaty? Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a United Nations treaty. A treaty is not made by the United Nations, but by a group of governments. The UN small arms, small arms process consists of governments who've come together what, what is to be done about this global problem. The UN does not exist separate from governments. And second, the topic of discussion isn't about a gun ban. We're talking about taking some moderate measures to reduce the illicit traffic in, in guns. And I was pleased to hear that Mr. Lapierre agrees that bad guys should be disarmed. Traffickers are among the very worst guys there are. International treaties are the usual way to deal with weapons. We have treaties on nuclear, on chemical, on biological weapons, the, and that's because Countries have recognized the destructive potential of those weapons and they want to hold governments and manufacturers accountable. Guns are the only weapons left outside of international treaties and these are the weapons killing hundreds of thousands of people. So yes, the US should acknowledge that it's part of the world, it's not exempt from the world's problems. In fact, it contributes disproportionately to many of the world's problems and it should cooperate with other UN member states to solve those problems. Thanks, Rebecca. Wayne, that sounds perfectly natural. What's your response? Well, my response is the Constitution of the United States. Our Supreme Court has ruled that no treaty supersedes the authority of the United States Constitution. In 1957, in Reed versus Covert, the Supreme Court said, no agreement with a foreign nation can confer power on the Congress or on any branch of government which is free of the restraints of the Constitution. Where Ms. Peters is headed with this is a UN conference in 2006 to write a, try to write a treaty basically banning civilian ownership of firearms. She doesn't like our Bill of Rights. She doesn't like our Second Amendment any more than she likes our First Amendment, where she has said, and I quote back in 4-4-2000, the First Amendment in the U.S. basically entitles anyone to tell any lies they want as long as it's in the name of politics. She doesn't like our freedoms, First Amendment, Second Amendment, and we're not going to let Ms. Peters or the United Nations take them away. So really, Rebecca, you're against the Constitution of the United States. I'm for international human rights. I'm for global standards applying across the world. You know, I recently reread 
George Orwell's Animal Farm, where it, the, uh, one of the, the commandments there was, all animals are created equal, but some animals are more equal than others. It seems to me that the National Rifle Association would say, all people on Earth are created equal, but some people, Americans, are created more equal than others. No, Americans are people like everyone else on Earth. They should abide by the same rules as everyone else. Right, let's get on to the next question. First, this one is for Wayne. What proposals does the NRA have to stop the flood of guns into unstable regions of the world? Well, I reject the term flood of guns. It, uh, what you have uh, is a flood of demand by good people that are, that are being terrorized. The best thing that could happen in unstable parts of the world, and I'm not trying to export this everywhere, but I believe it, is a free population allowed to embrace American constitutional freedom in the Bill of Rights. Free people elect good government. They create stable systems of laws. They see to their security. In Britain, in the United Kingdom in World War II, they were under attack. They asked for guns. You had a demand of good people for firearms. The United States and the NRA provided them, and we saved freedom. So what you have are good and bad confronting each other all over the world. And all too often, bad people are doing evil. The good people want to be protected, and they have a right to own a firearm. And I believe every citizen of the world has that basic human right. That it seems a, a powerful argument. Good people are allowed to protect themselves. Well, when you think of some of the regions of the world where our members are working, Saying that the answer is to provide more guns into those regions makes no sense at all. Many of our members are democracy campaigners. They're specifically working against corruption in government. They speak out against corruption. Many of them have been attacked by government representatives for their views. It doesn't help them to have guns. The way to get freedom the way to have democracy is to have stronger institutions. It is not to, ha to have, for example, a free and independent judiciary, independent from the political process, to have programs to reform the police forces. Those are the institutions that a society is built on. It's not going to be up to each individual person to be like a hero in a movie defending against this threat to freedom. So the threat to freedom is guns. No, the threat to freedom is, 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 is bad people, bad governments doing evil, and the good people need to protect themselves. And I reject this idea that guns have little legs and are moving all over the world. It, uh, it, it's ridiculous. It's criminals, it's bad governments, and the good people ought to be able to protect themselves, and it's the good people seeking protection is where the demand comes from. Rebecca, now with violent crime skyrocketing in countries that have banned guns, should individuals have the right to defend themselves with firearms? Well, that's a sweeping and inaccurate statement. Um, where to begin? Very few countries have banned guns, although some countries have recently reformed their laws, as I've said. It's simply not true that violent crime has increased in countries where guns have been regulated. And I guess we can talk back and forth about statistics, but um, it's not true. It isn't true. Australia is not in the grip of a crime wave. People in Britain are not cowering behind locked doors. Even if you are, maybe... <laughs> I'm not sure how many times, how likely you are to be mugged on the streets of London. Maybe you are six times more likely to be mugged on the streets of London than on the streets of an American city. But I tell you what, there's 68 gun murders in Britain each year and 11,500 in the US. I know where I would feel safer. So those statistics seem to go against the fact of, of violent crime in, in countries which have banned guns. I don't buy her statistics. I mean, I pick up papers like here in London, police fight 50% leap in gun crime. This is one of your papers. I checked with the, uh, both the government in the UK and the government in the US. Here's the US going way down. In spite the gun ban, Britain, UK, way up. In Australia, from the Australian Institute of Criminology, 37% increase in violent crime. On and on, murders way up in the United Kingdom from the government. I could go on all day with statistics, but you know, it really comes down to this. I really believe in all my heart. Several years ago, 
I made an ad at the NRA 20 years ago, and I asked American women one question. And I'd like to ask the same question of Ms. Peters here tonight. Ms. Peters, should you shoot this rapist before he cuts your throat? American women all over the United States answered yes. They wanted to be free, they wanted to be able to protect themselves, and they didn't want to die. And that's the difference between your philosophy and mine. You disarm the woman being attacked by this guy. I don't. Statistics can be made to prove everything, but do they help your case in terms of saying that, that violent crime isn't rocketing in places that have banned guns? Women need to live in societies that respect their human rights. Women need to be protected by police forces, by judiciaries, by criminal justice systems. People who have guns for self-defense are not safer than people who don't. There's research, for example, one of our members, a research agency in Latin America has shown that people who use a gun to try to defend themselves against a criminal are four times more likely to be killed than those who don't have a gun. Why? Because having a gun in that situation escalates the problem. Ms. Peters, you recently wrote, moderate gun control offers enormous dividends in public safety. Could you please tell us exactly what you mean by moderate gun control? We're not talking about banning all guns. We know that guns are not going to be banned outright. But moderate gun control means people who own guns should have to have a license. Guns should be registered. It means ensuring that certain categories of guns are not available to private citizens or to people who haven't had particular training and who are not subject to military or official discipline. For example, high power, rapid, rapid fire weapons like the ones that we banned in Australia. There should be a limit on the number of guns that civilians can own. And guns need to be kept out of the hands of people who are irresponsible, domestic violence offenders, of children. We need gun laws that put a reasonable obstacle in the path of someone likely to do something irrational and damaging. And the laws need to recognize that good people sometimes do bad things. There is not a clear distinction between the good guys and the bad guys in the world. As <laughs> and that, that, that only happens in the movies. So that seems... Uh, reasonable, reasonable laws, reasonable control. If Ms. Peters and the UN can't tell the difference between the good guys and the bad guys, I, I, I think we're all in trouble. It, uh, the fact is, uh, <laughs> breathing, it, it's as simple as water quenches thirst, uh, food quenches hunger. Good people know that a firearm will protect them. It, it, it goes back to humanity. I mean, people can tell the difference between criminals and bad governments and Mother Teresa. But, but let me say this. Ms. Peters, the audience deserves to know the truth. What you're really after is a global permission slip. Your definition of moderate is the most extreme definition imaginable, from your own words. Here you are in a CNN interview in October 2003. You want to ban every rifle that can shoot over 100 meters. On CNN, every rifle over 100 meters. That's a football field for people back in the US. That's every hunting rifle in the United States. The founding document of IANSA, your very own organization, says, and I quote, reduce the availability of weapons to civilians in all societies. Uh, duck, duck hunters in, in, in Australia taking away their pump shotguns. Here's your ad. And I can give you all these NGOs you work with, pamphlet after pamphlet after pamphlet. I can stack them to the ceiling where you call for no to individual armament. So let's be honest, you want to take guns away from all people, a global bureaucracy to do it, we're not going to let it happen. So is, is that true? We want to see a drastic reduction in gun ownership across the world, yes. We want to see much lower proliferation of guns among the civilian population, but also among governments. I mean, guns are misused by government officials, by police, by armies. 
One of the reasons why they justify their misuse of guns is because they say the civilian population is full of criminals who are so armed. There's a, an arms race that goes on between governments and criminals. Yeah, we want to reduce the number of guns in circulation around the world. Taking that a step further, Wayne, does the NRA object to governments having agreed on international treaties to regulate things like landmines, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons? Why shouldn't guns be subject to an international treaty just like them? Well, let me start out by saying, again, I reject any intrusion into the American Bill of Rights, into American freedom. Uh, systematically, social engineers want to regulate speech and control individual freedom and our entire Bill of Rights. And uh, it's an arena we're not going to let the UN go into. It, uh, the Bill of Rights protect us from that. But when you talk about landmines and chemicals and nukes and shoulder-fired rockets, you're not talking about anything that represents an individual right. The NRA has never promoted individual access to nukes chemical weapons. It's ridiculous. Landmines, nukes, they're all indiscriminate. You don't protect your family with them. You don't defend yourself with them. A firearm is a very specific tool. It allows you to protect your family, yourself, your house. And it's not indiscriminate like nukes and chemical weapons and all that. So I, I categorically reject the comparison these folks that want to ban guns sometimes throw out when they talk about nukes and chemical and biological. It's just ridiculous. It, uh, uh, firearms, yes, we'll defend firearms. They ought to be owned. People ought to have the choice whether they own them in the United States and I would hope throughout the world. So, so the NRA is actually very sensible. It doesn't uh, ask for proliferation of, of, of huge automatic weapons. We're talking just specifically about guns. So, so, so how can you rebut that? Well, I'm happy to hear that the NRA doesn't advocate individual ownership of nuclear, chemical and biological weapons. I was wondering where you would draw the line, so that's a start. I wonder though about Kalashnikovs, about man pads, about mortars, about assault weapons. There is no reason for those weapons to be owned in the civilian population. And the NRA represents an extremist point of view that it's completely unyielding on any aspect of the gun laws. It's, uh, well, where would you draw the line? So, so well, let's, let's draw the line, let's see if the, the, the NRA can sort of justify someone having a Kalashnikov at home. Well, she, Ms. Peters and her IANSA group have repeatedly been asked at the UN by the American manufacturers to draw the line exactly there, and she has refused every single time. It, uh, in the United States, machine guns, the type of guns she's talking about, have been heavily regulated since the 1930s. The gun debate going on in the U.S., it's not about those guns. It's about self-loading semi-automatic firearms. You have to pull the trigger each time to do it. And the people that want to ban guns try to confuse the American public that knows nothing about guns by telling them we're talking about machine guns, fully automatic guns. They spray bullets, weapons of war. That's the type of stuff Ms. Peters is doing right here. And we're not talking about oh, one of those guns. In fact, you cannot sell a firearm in the United States of America that is readily or easily convertible to a machine gun. So I think we need to stick to the facts. And do you really believe, as you've said in the past, that semi-automatic rifles and shotguns have no, well, really what we've just been saying, have no legitimate uh, role in civilian hands? Yes, I do. Semi-automatic weapons are designed to kill large numbers of people. They were designed for military use. Many people have bought them for other purposes, for example, for hunting, because they've been available. But there's no justification for semi-automatic weapons to be owned by civilian by members of the civilian population. When we were campaigning for the reform of the gun laws in Australia, one of the interesting groups that came out to support the new gun laws was a group called the Professional Hunters Association. They're the group that, that they're the original crocodile Dundee, you know, the macho big guys who control feral animals in the national parks, all of them. And they said they supported the new gun laws because Anyone who needed a semi-automatic to kill an animal was a city boy who shouldn't be out there with a gun in the first place. Yes, we believe that semi-automatic rifles and shotguns have no legitimate role in civilian hands. And not only that, handguns have no, civil no legitimate role in civilian hands.
Well, we were, we were almost there on a point of agreement, I thought, until that last piece. So what do you say? I, I was just going to say, we're, we're finally starting to get to the point. I mean, the fact is, Ms. Peters and IANSA and her UN crowd believe every firearm has no legitimate use. Uh, not just semi-autos, but pump actions, uh, shotguns, any rifle that can shoot over 100 yards. Hunters know that's every hunting rifle out there. Uh, handguns, she doesn't believe handguns have any legitimate use. The truth is, there's no such thing as a legitimate role for a firearm. Isn't that your real opinion, Ms. Peters? No, we recognize that hunting, for example, plays an important role in many cultures. You do not need a semi-automatic firearm, you do not need a handgun to kill a deer, to go hunting. We recognize that target shooting is also a sport in many countries. One of the concerns that was raised with the reform of the gun laws in Australia was that this would affect our Olympic performance. Actually, in that same year, Australia did very well in the shooting at the Olympics. And this year, I guess Britain didn't do that well in the shooting events at the, Olymp at the Olympics, but they did have their most successful Olympics yet. You can be a sporting nation without semi-automatic rifles or handguns. Wait. Wayne, how has the NRA been involved in the UN small arms process in terms of negotiating with the, with the UN? How successful have you been? Well, I mean, I think our participation in every way should be defined as uh, we oppose IANSA and the UN's attempt to weaken our Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. It, uh, we're going to get in your way. We're going to fight you folks at, at every turn. At uh, IANSA, the way we see it, the average people we represent, it's a club of unelected elitists accountable to no one. Our involvement shouldn't be defined as a participant. Our involvement is in, in opposition. We intend to defeat your intrusion. It, uh, you want to take foreign money. I know you got George Soros funding IANSA. You got a bunch of tax exempt foundations. And you have money from the United Kingdom, by the way, and Norway and Belgium, and a lot of it flowing into IANSA to try to change policy in the United States. We think that's inappropriate. How would folks in the UK like it if the US was secretly funding some stealth organization to change policy in the UK? It, uh, I mean, but believe me, our members, we're going to oppose what you're doing, Rebecca, because we're, we stand for the Second Amendment, and we're not going to let you folks eliminate our freedom. Rebecca, is there a way that the UN would welcome the NRA in terms of, of this negotiation? Well, the NRA has been very involved. As I said, they've had a great deal of influence there, and, and, uh, and, and they do bring some technical knowledge to the process. Um, but I, I, I guess that answer of Mr. Lapierre sort of demonstrates for me one part of the problem is the preoccupation that Americans have that the world is America. The purpose of IANSA and of activists around the world in relation to the UN small arms process relates to the UN, it relates to the world. It does not relate specifically to America. Ch trying to work through the UN is not the same thing as trying to, we, we're not thinking all the time about America, believe it or not. <laughs> most people on earth are not Americans. And for most people on earth, the rights of Americans are important, but other people's rights count too. And the right to life, for example, the UN has a special rapporteur on human rights and small arms who recently pointed out that governments have an obligation to protect the human rights of their citizens by restricting the proliferation of small arms. They're killing hundreds of thousands of people a year. These are real weapons of mass destruction. Wait, how can we make the companies and the countries that produce, supply and export guns more responsible for the damage that they cause. I reject the, the very premise that you're talking about. It, uh, the, the fact is uh, the standard in product liability all over is that third party criminal misuse of a product breaks the chain of liability. I mean, every manufactured product in the world starts out legally. Uh, now, if you're gonna say if a criminal gets a hold of that and misuses it, you're suddenly gonna allow Miss Peters group which is what they want to do, to sue that manufacturer out of business. You will not have a car made in the world. You will not, will not have an aspirin bottle made in the world. You will not have any type of product made. 
I mean, it's ridiculous. Miss Peters, she may have driven in a car here tonight. If some robber steals her car and goes and robs a bank with it, I doubt Miss Peters thinks that she somehow is responsible for that. And yet that's exactly what they're proposing. That what we do is we have laws in the United States that are real tough on anyone that is illegally smuggling guns. And firearms manufacturers are regulated from plant to purchaser. You cannot sell a manufacturer a new gun in this country without it being regulated from the, from the, all the way to the dealer by the government. And then it cannot be sold by the dealer without the federal government putting you through a background check and saying it's okay to deliver the gun. Now what they want, the person's law abiding, now what they want is if some criminal breaks in the house in the middle of the night and steals the gun and uses in a crime, they want to sue that firearms manufacturer out of business because what they really want to do is eliminate firearms manufacturers. In fact, I've even got a quote here from, once again, Ms. Peters, where what she says is she talks once again about the fact that nations that allow guns to be freely manufactured and possessed are undermining the international global community once again. This international globi, global nanny that is a pure fantasy that they're going to make it any better for anybody. Doesn't that seem a bit ridiculous to make everybody responsible for what they produce? Well, I'm no pleased how, uh, that Mr. Lapierre acknowledges that every gun starts out legal. Because the gun lobby has often said that gun laws, that they oppose gun laws because they don't affect criminals, as though there's a different source of guns for criminals. A whole criminal guns spring from the criminal gun tree, whereas law-abiding gun owners get their guns from the shops. It's important to recognize that. I don't think that aspirin bottles and cars are systematically supplied to places of armed conflict where they're used in human rights abuses. If they were, then the suppliers, the manufacturers, the countries that exported those products should be held accountable. We need international global norms that make those who supply deadly weapons accountable for what happens with them. Isn't that reasonable? Everybody's but, but accountable? Penalty, when I'm talking about legal, the criminals that are getting guns are not getting them from legal sources is what I'm talking about. They're buying them on the illegal market. If someone in the United States is Who's illegally- Who's the illegal market? Well, that, that's what I'm getting at. You gotta prosecute. It's criminals that are getting guns illegally, and the answer is prosecution. You know what our laws in the United States if someone's smuggling guns, like she's talking about? Five years per gun in a federal prison. If someone is smuggling 20 guns, that's 100 years in federal prison. They're gonna serve 80% of their sentence, which means they're gonna die in federal prison. And that's the law we be, ought to be enforcing. And that will solve her problem of the criminals or any illegal trade out there. That's what we ought to be doing. Let's take it another step, uh, Rebecca. What types of firearms do you think American citizens should be able to own? What, what exact type? I think American citizens should not be exempt from the rules that apply to the rest of the world. At the moment, there are no rules applying to the rest of the world. That's what we're working for. American citizens should have guns that are suitable for, the, for legitimate purposes that they can prove. I think that eventually Americans will realize that their obsession with arming themselves in fear, in a, a paranoid belief that they're going to be able to stave off the ills of the world through owning guns, through uh, turning every house into an arsenal, eventually Americans will go away from that. I think Americans who hunt should, have, should be able to, and who prove that they can hunt, should have single shot rifles suitable for hunting whatever they're hunting. I mean, American citizens should be, should, should be like any other citizens of the world. So, welcome to the world. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, it, again, what, what Ms. Peters said with this global nanny that she has, it's, it's, it's a fantasy. People in the United States want to be able to protect themselves. If someone is breaking down their door and coming into their house, they want to be able to save their life. 2.5 million times a year in the U.S., the good guys use a gun to protect themselves from criminals. I could once again stack to the ceiling the stories of how the good people protected themselves from bad people. Ms. Peters is not there at the scene of the crime. 
her George Soros or her global people at the UN that live behind security systems and locked uh, big security guards. They're not there. At the scene of the crime, it's the criminal and the victim. Let's get real in the world. And that victim deserves the right to protect himself from potential death or murder or robbery or rape by a criminal. And that's what we stand for. They say a global nanny's gonna protect you. I don't believe it, and I don't believe most people do. Isn't Isn't that the case, that people are going to be left vulnerable if they're not allowed to protect themselves? This is the irony that, that the gun lobby, based in a country where people do have their rights, should be obstructing a global process which would provide protection to people living in insecure conditions, in conflict zones, under dictatorships around the world. People need democracy to protect them. They do not need guns. Wayne, it seems that the gun lobby is advocating for law-abiding citizens to be armed as protection from governments. What are you so afraid of? What's to be feared that we need all these guns? History. In all of human history, good people have been vulnerable at best, murdered, raped, robbed, and slaughtered by the millions at the worst. You've had entire villages of Kurds gassed to death. Pol Pot, Nazi Germany, Bosnia, unarmed innocents butchered in Libya, by the way, who they put in charge of the Human Rights Commission. Uganda, Rwanda, unthinkable killing fields in Iraq, Iran, the former Soviet Union, Somalia, China, North Vietnam, and now they've disarmed people with their philosophy in the United Kingdom. There's a lot to be afraid of from Ms. Peters' vision of what the world is. And once again, the UN, that club of governments that she wants to vest all control in through IANSA, when the killing is contained within one border, whether it's Rwanda, or whether it's what's going on in the Sudan right now, or whether it's Bosnia, or whether you name the country in history, they haven't been very good coming in and stopping it because if it's contained within a border, the UN club doesn't like to intervene. Those people, women, men, the good people, shouldn't lose their right to protect themselves from the predators, the evildoers, the killers, and the genocidal governments. And that's what's ultimately at the end of this socialist fantasy that IANSA and Ms. Peters are proposing. Isn't it all about an inalienable right to self-protection? Well, I don't know how many members the National Rifle Association has in Rwanda, in Somalia, in Uganda, in Bosnia, but IANSA has members in all of those countries. And talk, they know about genocide. They know about mass murder. They are saying what they need in their countries is not more guns, but less guns. So. So the UN is out in those countries, not the NRA. Her, her bottom line on her philosophy is give guns to the government and anybody that the government decides they're going to slip guns to. Her sovereign is the government at the end of her chain. I'll tell you what my sovereign is, and people in the United States, it's the individual. We lived under... Right, it's the individual. And I believe if you look in human hearts all over the world, they believe the same thing. Wayne, thank you very much. Rebecca, thank you very much. Well, both protagonists have answered the questions that, that I saw fit to put to them. Uh, but I'm sure that the audience here at, at King's College have their own. And we're going to find out when we return in just a couple of minutes. Well, what do you think? In just a short while, you'll be able to access our website, Enter the password and we'll give you the opportunity to make your voices heard. You'll be asked to answer two questions. One, should the United States Senate support the proposed United Nations Treaty that bans private ownership of guns? And two, 
who do you think won the debate? I'll be back later to tell you how to get onto our website and how to participate. But now, let's go back to the Library of King's College London and our moderator, Paul Lavers. Now our next questions, which will be coming from members of our audience here at the Library at King's College. Uh, we're going to be begin on my right with a question for Rebecca Peters. Now, uh, when you ask your question, please state your name, where you live, and maybe the organisation you're from, and then please ask your question. So can I ask for the first question, please? <clears throat> I'd like to... Yes, my name is Joe Kelly from the Sportsmen's Association of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, <clears throat> my organisation defends all legal forms of shooting in the United Kingdom. And I would like to ask Ms Peters, uh, why do you place such unquestioning trust in governments and the United Nations when you clearly do not trust individuals for the best way to protect themselves and their families? Well, that's called civilization. Individuals come together, they form societies, they form governments. That's part of the contract that we make. It's a long time gone now since Thomas Hobbes described society as being characterized by a continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. I have confidence that people coming together into countries are going to operate better than a whole lot of individuals making up their own rules, taking the law into their own hands. That's the question. Right. Georgina Mortimer, Gun Control Network, and I'm in, from London. I would like to ask, why do you want to export American gun culture to the rest of the world? I object to describing the American culture as, as a gun culture. It, uh, I mean, if you're talking about Lexington and Concord, that that's how we want our freedoms, you bet. Those muskets that first defended that freedom at Concord Bridge. If you're talking about when the UK was under attack and called for the United States for firearms and the individual members of the NRA and our government provided them, you bet, absolutely. But what we really are is we're a freedom culture. That's what we're about. If Miss Peters goes and visits her friend, okay, with her three babies, and there's a knock on the door. You hear somebody, not a knock, but a pounding on the door. And you hear breaking glass. And someone is coming in that house, either in Australia or here in the UK. What's she going to do? What does she propose? Is she an expert in martial arts? What gives her that chance to live? That equalizer is the right to have a firearm to protect yourself. And she's got no answer for that. It's global government some social fantasy, they're going to protect everybody. She's not going to be there at the scene of the crime. She'll be in London or in New York or somewhere else. That victim will be there, and that's who I'm concerned about. And that victim ought to always have the choice, whether in the UK, the United States, Rwanda, by the way, how many millions died by machetes? She talked about Rwanda when the UN tucked tail and ran. Millions died by machetes. You bet a lot of those individual people in Rwanda would have liked to have had a firearm there. It's a freedom we're talking about. Next question from Ms. Peters. Good evening. I'm Dig Haydock. I'm a, a legitimate firearms license holding sporting shooter. Governments, legitimate governments and dictatorships over the course of history have used firearms regulation to take firearms out of the hands of legitimate holders of those firearms, um, law-abiding people, in essence. I just wondered if that disturbs IANSA and you in any way. First of all, it's, uh, the, uh, the gun lobby has um, very much overstated, characterizing as confiscation, which seems to be a preoccupation for the gun lobby. Um, what can I tell you? We, there, has not, there have not been mass confiscation programs. But also, countries change, laws change, products are banned. You know, in Australia there was a ban on certain types of home heaters because they were considered dangerous. And those products were recalled and people had to give them up. Why are firearms so different from any other product? You haven't so, banned so, all heaters. 
So, no, not all heaters, nor have we banned all firearms. So you're right, you're, so nor you, have we banned this is all the firearms. This is the answer I'm interested in. So you, you actually, because you, you didn't quite answer People the question the when standard, it was asked, answered the earlier. The law sets down Do you, minimum just, requirements just, just, to just own let, a firearm. Let's not develop into a, a I haven't free got the question out if again I can just, If I can just sort of paraphrase where, where, where I don't think you answered the question, was, was really more about sporting activities, mm -hmm. where, which you are involved in legitimate sporting activities, what are you going to do? How can you define where are the limits going to be? Which I think was what the, what the kernel of the question was. How are you going to define what will be allowed and what won't be allowed? Well, the, the definition of what's a legitimate sporting activity, of course, is always under pressure. The gun lobby has been pushing for the definition of target shooting to be expanded. So, for example, to be able to have semi-automatic rifles and shotguns as a legitimate target sport, which it is not. The, is it in the Olympics? No. <laughs> uh, right, hang, hang on a minute. Let's, let's not just get unruly. Uh, I think, yeah, so, times change. I know that the, it, pistol shooting used to be a sport that was allowed in the UK, and it no longer is. I'm sad for you. I suppose if you miss your sport, take up another sport. Take up a sport that does not require a weapon invented for the sole and specific purpose of killing another human being. Let's have the next question, please, for, for Wayne. Hello, my name is Peter Squires. I'm a professor of criminology from the University of Brighton and a writer and researcher on, on firearms and uh, crime issues. Uh, Mr. Lapierre began with, a, with an argument about an argument coming from the heart, but, but I'm a social scientist and we try to deal in facts. Um, it seems to me that Americans are desperate to, keep, to prove that gun control in Britain in particular has been a failure, but it clearly hasn't. Gun crime is coming down now. It is coming, it is coming down dramatically in Scotland. And over the last 18 months, it has come down by 16%. It only ever featured in six or seven hotspots, major cities, and the figure would be even dramatically lower were it not for the confusion introduced by replica firearms, which our government, for some strange reason, refuses to ban. Why cannot you accept these statistics? They are British statistics. In Britain, gun control is working. are disagreeing with you, and every statistic I have from your government says just the opposite, that the UK now leads the US by a large margin in assaults, robberies, burglaries, all types of violent crime. Your, your laws now give the home invader a, a head up, a hand up on the homeowner. It, uh, I mean, the homeowner tries to defend himself. He's probably going to go to jail. It, uh, Every statistic I've seen here in this country, your violent crime is rising and ours in the United States is going down. The other point I'd like to make is a firearm's a tool. It doesn't jump up off a table and do something bad. It's a tool. Ms. Peters, I heard her you know, talk about the fact that, my gosh, look at all this that's happening. You know, and if a gun's invented only to kill people. A gun, if it's misused, yes, it can kill someone. And that's why you want to be very tough no sympathy. Throw them in jail for someone that misuses a gun for life. That's good with me. They want to coddle criminals. That's another thing on their agenda. It, but a gun can also save a person's life. If a criminal is breaking down their door, it may very well save the victim's life. It can be used for hunting. It can be used for recreation. It can be used for sport. We at the NRA have 50,000 safety instructors. 35,000 shooting and hunting clubs, 9,000 law enforcement instructors, and we have put 17 million kids through our Eddie Eagle Child Safety Program, and we have gun accidents down to the lowest level ever in U.S. history, and we are leading the way in the United States to arm good people, prosecute bad people, throw the book at them, put them in jail for a long, long time, and that makes people safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm so sorry. We've, we've actually run out of time. I'm sorry. We've run out of time for the, our question section of this, this show. Thank you very much. We're going to be back in a few short minutes for the summation from each side of the debate. Thank you so much.
We have just heard a series of questions presented by the audience in the library of King's College London. I'm sure that you at home have been following them and have come up with your own conclusions about who is doing a better job in presenting their case. Now, in just a few moments, I will be giving you the password so that you'll be able to go to our website and cast your vote for the person you think has won the debate. The website is thegundebate.com. Thegundebate.com. That is where you'll find a link to vote and answer a simple question. All you need now is the password, which I'll give you in a few minutes at the end of this historic debate. The result of the poll will be automatically tabulated and posted on the website from October the 21st. Before the voting begins, though, let's go back to the library of King's College and our moderator, Paul Lavers. And now we give each of our speakers a chance to make a closing statement and wrap up the arguments for their side of the debate. The motion once more, should the United States support the proposed United Nations Treaty that bans private ownership of guns? We'll begin with Rebecca Peters. Thank you, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, in the time that we have been sitting here in London discussing this issue, more than 100 people will have lost their lives to gun violence around the world, and countless others will have been injured or will suffer the grief and pain of losing family and friends. Guns are causing enormous suffering in the world at large. Armed conflicts are claiming lives in huge numbers. Countries are emerging from conflicts and then going into transformations that could plunge them back into conflicts at any time because the guns have not been taken away. Guns are being used as tools to intimidate and commit crimes and hundreds of thousands of people around the world are living this reality every day. So much for guns and freedom. Mr. Lapierre talked a lot about punishment and the need to put people in prison. Here's another statistic. The US is the country that has the largest proportion of its population in prison. Is that a society? worth emulating? I don't think so. We are talking about prevention. People shouldn't have to think about the question of whether they're going to defend themselves every day. We represent the public health community, the human rights community, the victim support community. People have a right to live free from fear rather than waiting for the moment when they're going to be afraid and they're going to need to decide whether to kill someone or not. I think Mr. Lapierre has been watching too many movies. That is not how it is in real life. Common sense dictates that guns cannot and do not make societies or civilians safer. A higher level of access to guns means increased lethality. In response to the charge that Britain's gun laws have led to soaring rates of violence, I'd like to compliment Mr. Lapierre for braving the trip to London. It's such a dangerous society here. <laughs> and point out once again, 68 gun murders here per year compared with 11,500 in the USA. We've seen a lot of statistics thrown around and I would say there has been some misrepresentation. I'm reminded of a time when the NRA's propaganda was talking about Australia and saying that Australia was in the grip of a crime wave, that Australian citizens were cowering behind locked doors, that Australians had been disarmed. So much so that the Attorney General of Australia had to write to Charlton Heston, the president of the National Rifle Association, asking him to desist. And he said in his letter, there are many lessons we can learn from America, but how to deal with gun violence is not one of them. <laughs> if guns made a society safer, then the US would be the safest country on earth. That's clearly not so. It's the least safe of the developed countries. For all the wealth 
and consumerism and technology that America has, that's a paradox, that it still lives in fear. It still sanctions the idea that individual private citizens should have a gun ready for the moment when they may want to kill another human being. And that's a cultural difference between America and many other developed countries, actually. Mr. Lapierre has referred to Australia and the UK as having lost the, the right to have guns for self-defense. That was never the case. Most developed countries do not sanction the ownership of guns with the intention of killing another person. The laws changed in Australia and the UK that made no difference to the question of whether you were allowed to have guns for self-defense. You were not allowed to have guns for self-defense. If you had a gun for self-defense, you were breaking the law. I'm very happy to know that the shooters here tonight are not breaking the law. And I want to reassure you that there is no proposal to ban private firearm ownership, actually. We're talking about regulation. We're talking about stopping trafficking. We're talking about bringing the arms trade under control to stop guns getting into the hands of criminals and of drug gangs and of human rights abusers. Why doesn't the NRA support that aim? Thank you. please, the closing statement from Mr. Wayne Lapierre. Thank you very much. Whatever your personal opinion of me or my country, one must concede that the United States of America offers every law-abiding human being the greatest measure of personal freedom mankind has ever experienced. Why should Ms. Peters or IANSA or the United Nation, with all their inherent failures, be given supremacy over any honest man or woman. We see their mission for what it is, just another reemergence of the same old socialist imaginings of the 20th century, fantasies that prey upon citizens who are first to fall for their social engineering, students on campus, journalists in the media, and intellectuals in think tanks, elitist who think they know better than us how to live our lives, how to spend our money, how to educate our children, how to protect our homes. People who believe that if they could just be in charge, they could make our lives perfect. That's Ms. Peter's basic premise. If you will surrender your right to own a firearm to the whim of a new global godmother, you will be safer. But study the nations where Ms. Peters has had her way, and you will think twice about that bargain, that you can have more safety, stability, certainty, you name it, in return for personal freedom. That's a bargain I won't fall for, nor will most Americans. The promise of, you'll gain this if you give up freedom, is precisely the bargain my forefathers rejected. I've devoted my life to doing the same. It's the same contagion we've beaten back for 80 years. Its latest puppeteer is George Soros. His billions of dollars teem like a new toxin polluting American politics. George Soros, one of her major benefactors at IANSA. He's using a new political machine called a 527 committee designed to manipulate our elections funding massive coalitions like Ms. Peters, who want to transform American freedom into something less, far less. That's exactly what happened in Australia, England, Canada, and South Africa, in the homes of others supposedly free peoples, who lined up like sheep to surrender their weapons. Some of them very upset about it. They registered their guns. They told them they'd never ban them. The next thing, the politicians broke their promise. The next thing was a ban, to knock on the door or go to jail. So where do you stand? History and human nature support my demand for freedom. But Ms. Peters' initiatives against these freedoms have made great progress. Ask yourself, what are our respective motivations 
I doubt Ms. Peters will get rich in her line of work. I sure won't get rich in mine. But if you study the words of Ms. Peters in defense of her global gun control movement, you will find sweeping police powers offensive to the entire Bill of Rights in the United States, not just the right to keep and bear arms. Ms. Peters is well versed in the law. She's a lawyer. But read her testimony. Read her documents. You'll see endless demands for record keeping, oversight, inspections, supervision, tracking, tracing, surveillance, marking, documentation, verification, paper trails, and data banks, all well funded for new global agencies to be created and new international data centers. And it goes on and on and on. Those are her causes. Her words and deeds prove it. Every pamphlet they put together, that's what it says. But in her words, I have been unable to find anything about our causes. Nowhere, nowhere in her testimony, in her documents, in her brochures, can I find any demand for arrest, prosecution, conviction, and mandatory sentencing or imprisonment for illicit traffickers, gun runners, rapists, robbers, murderers, you name it. Building prisons. I have been unable to find in her testimony provisions by which oppressed people may be liberated and freed from tyrants and from dictators. I could not find a thought anywhere about respecting anyone's right to self-defense, privacy, property, due process, or observing political freedom of any kind. Those are our causes. Those causes. There are causes at the NRA, in the hearts of American citizens. Our words and deeds prove it every day. And I invite you, all of you here tonight, to fight with me on the side of freedom. It's truly worth fighting for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our debate for this evening. Thanks very much to Rebecca Peters and to Wayne Lapierre, and thanks to you all for joining us here at King's College in London. Thank you very much. Good night. Well, now the debate has concluded, it's time to give you the password. You access the website by typing thegundebate.com. There you'll find the link to answer a simple question about the debate. You may only vote once. The results of the poll will be automatically tabulated and posted on the website from October the 21st. The password you must enter is GUN2004. That's G-U-N-2004. Thank you for joining us and for participating in this unique transcontinental event. From London, good night.